So yesterday we were talking about inertia, Newton's first law. Okay, and we were looking at applications of that, okay, how it's a big part of a lot of the safety systems that are in your car along with Newton's second law. Okay? Um, and we said the most important safety device or part of your car was something not everything has. Not all cars have as much of it, and that's mass. Okay? Mass is a measure of how much matter an object or system contains. Okay? So the bigger it is, the more mass it would have because the more matter it would have. We're comparing these two objects. You can't get a penny anymore, but they okay, had a small coin. There's not a lot of, um, of matter there, so it doesn't have very much mass. By comparison, a super tanker has a lot of mass. Okay, there's a lot of matter there, so it's much bigger, and it would thus have a lot more inertia. It's really easy to move a penny. Just flick it, and off it goes. Okay, whereas if I do that to a super tanker, well, virtually nothing's going to happen. It has far, far more inertia. Now, on Earth, obviously, other factors play a part in not being able to move a super tanker very much. What if I had the super tanker out in space, where there wasn't any like air resistance or gravity or anything like that? Would I be able to move the super tanker then? Yes, you could. Sure, good. But it would be a very, very small amount. But I'd be able to move it. Okay? In space, even the smallest little push okay, is still going to cause an acceleration because there's nothing to resist the movement other than the inertia of the object. So if I push on something, like if I'm out in space and let's say I'm against the, the side of the space station that I'm you know, from, okay? um, if I push on the space station, the space station is going to accelerate away from me and I'm going to accelerate in the opposite direction. Okay? We're both going to accelerate, because when I push on the space station, the space station pushes back, and we both accelerate. Now, those accelerations are not the same. Okay? The acceleration of the spacecraft or space station is going to be almost immeasurable, but there. Okay? There's going to be an acceleration. My acceleration will be a lot bigger, because I'm a lot smaller. Okay? The forces are equal. When I push on the spacecraft, it pushes back with an equal and oppositely directed force. That's why my acceleration is so much greater. That small amount of force that I exert doesn't affect the space station as much as it affects a small mass like myself. Okay. Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Okay. I mean, yes, on Earth, if I had this super tanker and I tried to push it, nothing would happen. But it's not so much because of its inertia, certainly that's a part of it, but because it would be sitting on the ground and there'd be friction and all of that kind of stuff would be hard to overcome. Okay. In space, where none of that stuff is in play, I could accelerate. I'm not saying I could like, throw it like Superman, okay? but I'd be able to make it go. All right. Now, uh, mass is a scalar quantity. Okay? It's important for us to remember that. The measure of how much matter there is is not vector. Okay? Like, you know, I don't say I'm, I'm 75 kilograms down. Okay? Like that's not, that's not how we measure mass. Okay? Mass is scalar. Weight, on the other hand, is vector. Because weight is the force of gravity pulling on your mass. Okay? So it's different. Okay? Weight is a force. Mass is how much of you there is. So if I want to lose weight, what should I do? Go to the moon. Yeah. Go anywhere where gravity pulls less. And I'll weigh less. There won't be any less of me. Okay? But I can lose weight by simply going somewhere where gravity doesn't pull as hard. Okay? If I go on a diet, it's not because I want to lose weight. It's because I want to make less of me. That's less mass. Okay? But nobody ever says it that way because it doesn't sound as cool. Oh, I want to lose mass. What's wrong with you? That's people would look at you funny. Okay? But in actual fact, that's exactly what you're doing. Okay? You want to lose weight, you don't have to diet to do that. Okay? Just get a little further from the center of the earth and you will weigh less. Okay? All right. So that's the big thing here. Weight and mass are two entirely different things. The weight we feel when we pick up a heavy object is the force of gravity acting on the mass of the object. Therefore, 
weight is the force of gravity on your mass. Okay? And we actually calculate weight like this. Force of gravity is your mass times the acceleration due to gravity. mass is as a safety feature. Right? Now, I'm going to kind of show you what that looks like. Right? First, I'm going to show you a, a crash that my cousin was involved in. Okay? I showed this to period three because we got that far, so we didn't get the chance to show you guys. Okay? Um, she's in a small, like, I don't know, it's like a neon kind of car. Like, it's really small. Okay? Um, and she gets T-boned by a distracted driver. Right? Driving like a I think it's a Nissan Pathfinder. It's a fairly large SUV. Okay. Um, now, she was actually very badly injured in this in this crash. She spent like a year in the hospital, broken pelvis, broken femur, like because okay, she got T-boned on the driver's side. There's not nearly as much protection on the on the sides of cars because we don't normally get hit on the side at high speed. Most of the safety features are up the front of the car. Okay, because if you hit something, it's usually going to be moving forward. Okay, that's where the bulk of the safety stuff needs to be. So the crumple zone on the side of the car is only the width of the door. And then you've hopefully got side curtain airbags that will deploy and protect you a little bit, but there's nearly as much protection on the side of the vehicle as there is on the front. Okay, so you'll kind of see what happens here and how big a deal mass makes okay, in a crash. Okay, so my cousin is in the white car in front of this one. Okay? The distracted driver is going to come in from the left. Okay? This car here probably saves her life because he gets out in the intersection and gets clipped first. And it takes a bit of speed off of the distracted driver who doesn't even hit the brakes until about here. All right, you see how far into the car the SUV is penetrated? Okay. And it pushed her quite a ways, okay, because he has more mass than she does. Now, granted, he was also moving, and she was barely moving forward. But the end, in the end, the acceleration and the movement was all forward for him, okay, which means he won. Sadly, because he was at fault, but he won because in the end, the movement was in the direction he was going, not in the direction the other car was going. Okay, that sort of makes sense? Like if this had been a semi-truck, it would have looked a lot different. Okay, if he'd have hit a semi-truck, the semi-truck wouldn't have moved very much, probably would have kept going forward, and he would have stopped dead. Okay, um, so mass, and basically what we're trying to illustrate here is mass is important. Okay, the other part of it was he did hit this car first, and that took away some of his... Um, ability to do work, some of his energy okay, uh, by hitting that car. Had he not hit that car, it would have been a lot worse. Okay. All right, so yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. Right, like his tire smoke starts way back here. At least he didn't run off. He was trying to take care of her. But, um, now, something else that they do in, this was in Hawaii. My cousin lives in Hawaii. Okay. Um, back up even more. We can't do this in Canada because it doesn't work. Okay, All of our highway barricades are concrete, like these ones. What are these? Yeah, they're water or sand. Usually, in, well, usually they're water. Okay, in tropical places that never freeze, okay? Because this is much safer. If anybody hits one of those barricades, the plastic just kind of ruptures, the water goes out in all directions and slows you down far more gradually, okay? We we're talking about how that making the time of the crash take longer is a big safety thing. That's exactly what that does, okay? It makes it safer when you hit one of those. It doesn't work in Canada because half the year they're frozen and they're concrete anyway, okay, when they're frozen. So. 
um, we can't really do that unless we filled it with like propylene glycol or you know antifreeze of some kind like that. Okay, but then of course when they get ruptured, then you got that stuff spilling everywhere. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Now we got a couple of crash test videos. I got to pause the recording for these though. Okay, so Newton's first law, this whole idea of inertia, we looked at the, the video yesterday with Homer, okay, and he couldn't stop, with Woody who just drifted away, okay, those kind of things. That's, that's kind of the, the most um, kind of visually representative of Newton's first law, okay? Um, if nothing else happens to the object, it's going to continue to travel at a constant velocity. Now, that also means a straight line, okay? If it's a constant velocity, then the vector can't change either. Because okay. it's possible for something to travel at a constant speed, but actually be accelerating. Okay. Because acceleration is any change in velocity. That includes direction. So when I go around a corner, I go around a corner at a constant speed. But my velocity is changing because I'm constantly changing the direction I'm going. Okay. I can't change direction unless there's an unbalanced force that's pushing me that way. It may not make me go faster or slower, but it can turn me, and that still counts. Okay, a hockey puck, it just slides along the ice, and it goes perfectly straight. Okay, it doesn't change direction, because there's no unbalanced forces. Same with a curling rock. If you don't put any spin on it, nobody sweeps it, it goes perfectly straight. If there's no unbalanced forces to make it turn. How do you turn a curling rock? Spin it. Yeah, you can put a spin on it. Okay, if you do an out turn, it'll turn that way. If you do an in turn, it'll turn that way. Okay, um, and your sweepers. Okay, if you've ever watched it, you know they get like hurry hard, and they're like, you know doing the sweeping in front of it. Okay, if your sweepers are really good, they can actually direct and steer. The, um, the rock, not by putting the room on it and moving it around, but by actually sweeping on one side or the other. Because when they sweep, what they do is they melt the little uh, beads of ice that are on the top of the sheet of ice. Okay? They melt those, and when that happens, it's more slippery on one side of the rock than on the other. And it's going to naturally slow down more on the side where there's more friction, and it'll actually turn that way. So if you want a, a, a curling rock, to turn, so here's our curling rock, okay, and I want it to go over here, then I would actually sweep on this side a little bit, okay, because then there'll be more friction in the direction I want it to go, and it'll be pulled in that direction, okay, by that frictional force. All right, so this is Newton's first law. Okay. An object at rest will remain at rest, and an object traveling at a constant, well, I should say velocity, not speed, velocity, okay, will continue to do so unless acted upon by a net force. So because of Newton's first law, we might actually be able to do something like this, where if you had like a stack of like poker chips or something like that, okay, if you flick one at the bottom of the stack, you might actually be able to knock the bottom chip out and the stack wouldn't move. It would just come back down. Okay? Because it has enough inertia that moving the bottom one out doesn't pull it in one direction or another. Okay? This is also, how many people have ever seen someone who tried to pull the tablecloth out from under the dishes? Most people miserably fail when they do that because they do it wrong, okay? um, or they have like you know a high friction tablecloth. It, it, there's a lot of, that has to go into making that work, but it is possible. Don't try it with your parents' best china. Okay? Like get some like dollar store dishes or something if you really want to try it. Um, but the key to it is that you need to pull the tablecloth out quickly and straight. Okay. What most people do is they grab the tablecloth and they do this, and they go, yeah, and they lift it up, okay? and it makes this wave that goes through the tablecloth and tips over all the dishes. Okay. If you watch someone who knows what they're doing when they do that trick, 
they'll actually get right up to the edge of the table, they'll curl the tablecloth in their fists, and they'll pull down like this. Okay? Because then the tablecloth can only slide forward. Okay? You're not pulling up on the tablecloth at all. And the inertia of the dishes is that they are still. And unless they're acted upon by an unbalanced force, they'll stay where they are. So if that's a fairly slippery tablecloth, okay, not like a cotton one, they look like the plastic kind of ones, okay, if it's fairly slippery, you can just zip it out from underneath really quickly. Okay? But the key is you've got to do it really fast. Okay? So you don't interrupt the inertia of the dishes sitting on top. If you pull it slowly, they'll move with it. Okay? Because everything will go together. The trick is to do it fast. Okay? Um, you'd be surprised just how many places in your life this law applies. Okay? Have you ever tried with a roll of toilet paper to just go like that and rip off a square without holding the roll? Okay? There's, you can do it, but you gotta do it fast. Because if you pull it slow, the whole roll comes off. Okay? But if you go like quickly on the perforations, right, and you kind of go across, you don't bother the inertia of the roll. Okay? Because it tears before it can exert a force on the rest of the roll. If you do it wrong, you're rolling it all back up again. Okay? These are all things you're going to try. <laughs> now, don't try the tablecloth one. Because okay? it just never ends well. Okay? That's how that works. It's all to do with not disturbing the inertia okay, of the object. Okay. And it's also why on slippery roads, we just keep right on going. Okay. There isn't enough friction to act as an unbalanced force to stop us. Okay. And so we just keep sliding. Okay, now, how many people have ever watched someone who is like from a tropical country the first time it gets icy? Ever watched them walk? Quite fun. And I'm not saying that like in a mean way. It's just that unlike ourselves who've lived in a cold climate our whole lives, they don't know how to walk on ice. Okay? Because it's all about which way you direct your forces. Okay? We know just inherently, because we've all fallen on our butt at least once or twice, okay, that if you try and walk normally, okay, and you push like you normally do, which is down and back, you just fall. Okay? That the ice is too slippery to support that backward force. When we're walking on ice, we do this. We pick up our foot, okay, put all our weight on the other one, set that one down, transfer our weight to it, pick up the other one, right? Like we all do that. We just know how. We don't push backwards when we're walking on something slippery. Okay? Because if we do, we know it's, there's not going to be enough friction and we're going to slip. But what we do is make sure that our, you know, our inertia is over top of our contact. And our mass is over the top of that contact. Okay, in this situation here, we've got a book sitting on a desk. So we've got this situation. Okay, what's the book going to do right now? Stay still. There's no unbalanced forces. Gravity is pulling down, the desk is pushing up. Okay, what if I push that way? Okay. Is that there was now an unbalanced force, right? While I was pushing, the book not just moved, but while I was pushing. It slowed down after I stopped pushing, yes. Okay. When I started pushing, the book accelerates. Right. It had an initial velocity of zero, and it started moving. So it was accelerated by this unbalanced force. Okay. Now, I'm pushing on the book right now, and the book's not moving. Why? Are the forces still balanced? Yeah. Gravity down, desk up, friction back, my force forwards. But because it's not enough to overcome the friction, the forces are still balanced. When they overcome the friction, then there's a net force. That's what's going on in this picture right here. Right? There's the applied force, that would be me pushing on the book, 20 newtons that way. Okay? And then there's a force of friction resisting that, 18 newtons the other way. And as a result, there's a net force of 2 newtons to the left, and the book accelerates to the left. That's a Newton's second law situation. The forces are out of balance, there is a net force, okay, and thus the book accelerates. 
Everybody all right with that idea? So when we're talking about a net force, okay, um, there's often, in basically every situation, more than one force, several forces acting on an object. The net force is the vector sum of all of the forces. Okay? That's the definition of net force, and we're going to be using net force every day for this whole unit. So for that book, we actually didn't have this situation that they drew. Okay? Here's the desk. Here's the book. We had gravity acting down on the book. We had what's called the normal force, the force of the desk, pushing up on the book. And those two forces are equal, right? Because the book's not accelerating vertically, is it? Okay, so those two forces add up to zero. Okay? And then there was okay, my force going that way. We would call that an applied force. And then there was friction resisting, but it was smaller. Okay? So the net force is the vector sum of all these forces. How do I find the vector sum? I draw a vector diagram. Okay, so here's the, here's the starting point. Okay, there's the force of gravity. There's the normal force. Okay. There's my applied force. There's my force of friction. Right? I've just drawn them all tail to head okay, in a proper vector diagram, and I see that's what, that what's left at the end Okay, what I've got at the end, I'm going to have to draw it in red, I guess, okay, is right here. This is my net force. That is the vector sum, or the resultant of, all of these forces. Okay? And it's a net force to the left, to the right, sorry, okay, on that diagram. Okay? That is what we call a free body diagram. For all of our Newton questions in this unit, that will be your givens. Okay? So a question will say, you've got this object, its mass is this much, here are the forces acting on it, calculate the acceleration. Or here's these forces, um, the acceleration of the object is this much in this direction, calculate the missing force. What was the force of friction or something like that. Okay? So it'll be a lot of vector stuff, okay, which we're familiar with, okay? but it's going to be with forces instead of displacements and acceleration and velocities. Okay? So a net force causes all objects to accelerate. Their acceleration is dependent on their mass, okay? according to Newton's second law. The net force is the mass of the object times its acceleration. Okay, all done? Yep. Okay, awesome. Just come on in. Okay, so when a net force acts, it causes an object to accelerate. That acceleration is directly proportional to the net force and inversely proportional to the mass. Okay, what that means in English is that the bigger the net force, the greater the acceleration. The bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. And that's from Newton's first law. Newton's first law says that the more inertia or the more mass you have, the more likely you are to keep doing what you were doing at first. Okay? So mass is going to affect acceleration opposite. Okay? The bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. Okay? I mean, that was the whole idea yesterday when I said two, two objects are coming towards you on the street, a kid on a tricycle and a school bus. Okay? You got a chance if you step in front of the kid with the tricycle because it's got less mass. Okay? Got less inertia than the bus. 
Okay, so quantitatively, the inertia of an object is measured by its mass, okay, such as that of a train indicating a large inertia. So inertia is the natural tendency of an object to remain at rest or in motion at a constant velocity, okay, or constant speed along a straight line is the same as constant velocity, okay. The mass of an object is a quantitative measure of inertia. The bigger your mass, the more inertia you have. Okay, everybody all right with that idea? Now, here's another place where we use Newton's first law in a safety device. This is how your seat belts work. Okay? You ever get in the car and you're in a rush, you grab the seat belt and it locks, and then you just like, and you just keep pulling and it won't come and you're like, no, you have to calm down, slow down, let it go back in, you've been pulled slowly, but you keep doing that. Okay? Um, the reason for that is your seat belt, the apparatus that lets it un unravel, okay, or lock in place is basically structured like this. There's a ratcheted wheel, there's a locking bar, your seat belt winds around the ratcheted wheel, and there's a pendulum, okay, and that pendulum just swings freely, right? If you're traveling, so this is going to be, this is my ghetto physics pendulum, okay? this is what happens when you cut spending from education, you get ghetto physics roll of athletic tape on the drawstring from my hoodie. Okay. okay, so if I'm walking at a constant speed, the pendulum stays straight up and down. Right? Because its inertia is the same as mine. We're both moving forward. Alright, so now I'm moving forward and I stop. What's the pendulum do? It keeps going, right? Because of Newton's first law. There's no stopping that. You can't stop Newton's first law. If I'm walking along and I stop, the pendulum keeps going. Because its inertia is to keep going at the speed I was walking at because it was walking with me. That's what's used to lock your seatbelt in place. Because nothing can stop that from working. Okay? You don't want something electronic to govern the locking of your seatbelt. If anything fails in the microchip, power supply, or anything like that, then the seatbelt won't work. Okay? This is infallible. The pendulum will move forward when the car stops suddenly. And when the pendulum moves forward, it tilts the locking bar into position so it can't allow the ratcheted wheel to unroll. Okay? And that jerks the, the um, or locks the, the seatbelt in place, jerks you to a stop. Okay? When you're pulling the seatbelt out too fast, what you're doing is essentially just disrupting the whole apparatus. You just jerk the whole apparatus quickly and the, and the locking bar just rattles into place. It's not far, right? That's why that can happen. It's not a big thing that's required in order to lock it. It's small because we want it to lock all the time. Okay? If we'd rather it locks too often than not enough. Okay? And so that's why you can do that with a really sharp movement. Okay? You, can, uh, you can make it vibrate enough or move enough. Okay. okay, now the same idea is used um, to detonate or trigger airbags. Okay, um, the same thing that your phone uses to tell you or to, to rotate your screen, okay, like so if you're holding it like this, you can read it, you tilt it like this, and the screen moves. Okay, the same device that tells your phone which way you're holding it is what's used to detonate an airbag. Right? So it's called a, a gyro. So there's like a, a metal ball and it's surrounded by like current carrying wire. Kind of like this, but like way more symmetrical. Okay. Um, when you're traveling at a constant speed, the ball stays in the middle. Okay. And when you stop suddenly, like really suddenly, the ball will go forward because it's on springs. Okay. It'll go forward and when it touches this current carrying wire, that's the switch that fires the airbag. Okay? Now that only happens if you have a certain acceleration. Because okay? um, we don't want the airbag to go off if you hit the brakes really hard and don't hit anything. We don't want the airbag to go off. Okay? So it only goes off if there's enough acceleration to move that ball forward and touch the wires. Okay? And then that'll send the, the current to the bomb that detonates your airbag. 
It's the same thing, okay? When you move your phone like this, there's a ball in there that just gravity pulls it down and tells it, okay, the phone's this way. Turn it, gravity pulls the ball down, now the phone's this way. If you were on the International Space Station, your cell phone would not work. Well, probably more anyway, because you're really far from all the transmitters, but okay. Um, but that part of it wouldn't work. It would be switching all the time. If you moved it this way, it would switch, okay? Because it would just, just go on inertia, right? All you'd have to do is just, you know, start spinning the phone and, yeah, because it just wouldn't work. Gravity's not there to pull the ball and tell it which way you're holding it. Okay? You'd have to just lock the screen a certain way. All right, now, airbags used to have a contact switch. It wasn't like this. It wasn't an inertial switch. It was a contact switch. So there was a, actually a sensor in the bumper, and if something just hit the bumper, it would set the airbag off. Okay, those were early, early airbags. And there's this, I, I couldn't find it when I was looking for it the other day, but there was this video on YouTube of this guy in a convertible, in a Mercedes convertible, and there's this old lady crossing the street in the walker, and he's honking at her because she's taking so long to get across. Just keeps laying on the horn, laying on the horn. She takes her purse and winds up and smokes the bumper with her purse, and boom, the airbag goes off. It's like one of those instant karma kind of videos. Um, but that was back when, like that could happen back in the early days of airbags where there was actually a contact sensor on the, on the bumper. There weren't many cars manufactured that way because obviously that was a pretty major defect, okay? If you, you know, were pulling into the garage and you tap the wall, okay, boom, the airbag goes off. And yeah, that's like, it just, it wasn't a good way to trigger the airbag. Inertial switches are much more reliable, okay, and much better on that. Okay, um, so the free body diagram stuff, which is what I was just uh, showing you there a minute ago. We got, we got, uh, yeah, okay. um, so a free body diagram works like this. Okay, you want to add this to your notes because it's not in your notes. Okay, so a free body diagram is going to be your givens for any Newton's second law question. Okay, you don't have to be a, an artist to do a free body diagram, because everything turns into a box, okay? Whether it's a car, or a person, or an elephant, it's a box, okay? And you, run, you draw the box, and you just put the mass inside, okay? I have a 15 kilogram object, doesn't matter what it is, it's a box, it's 15 kilograms, okay? And then, I draw my forces as though they come from the center of the mass, center of the box. So if this was a, a box that was sitting on, on the desk, like the book was there a minute ago, okay, I would draw gravity acting down. And sometimes we even calculate what that is and we put the number in. Okay. I would have the force of the desk, which we call the normal force, acting up. Okay. And um, if that's all there was, that would be my free body diagram. What's the acceleration of my object? Zero. There's only two forces acting on it, and they're balanced. Okay, when there's no unbalanced forces, Newton's first law applies. Object stays stationary or travels at a constant velocity. Okay, uh, let's say there was a force of 20 Newtons forward. Now what's that object doing? How? Constant velocity or accelerating? Uh, That's a tough one. You weren't here when I explained that. Accelerating? It's, it's starting from the stop. Yeah, it's accelerating. Exactly. Because of, and again, this is the thing that you guys missed, okay? Newton's second law says that a net force causes a mass to accelerate. So, because there is a 20 Newton net force in this situation, that 15 kilogram mass is going to accelerate because F net is not zero. When F net is zero, zero divided by mass, zero. We don't get any acceleration. But when there is a net force, there is an acceleration. Okay? And as I was saying before, okay, that net force has a linear or direct relationship to acceleration. So if I doubled it, my acceleration would double. Okay, they're linearly or directly related. Whatever change I make to the net force, the same change is going to happen to the acceleration. Now, with mass, 
the relationship is inverse. Okay. We manipulate that for acceleration as we did a minute ago. Okay. We got net force over m. If I double f net, a will be two times bigger. Okay. If I leave f net the way it is and I double the mass, what will happen to the acceleration? Half. Exactly. It'll be cut in half because it'll be dividing by a number that's twice as large. Okay. So mass is inversely related to acceleration. Okay. The bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. Okay. Now, this is a fairly simplistic situation because we got two forces that add up to zero and then only one other force. Okay. That's our net force. We're going to get into situations where we would have okay, this. Absolutely right, that is one of the steps that I'm going to have to do. Draw the vectors too. Right, draw a vector diagram. All a free body diagram does is show you the forces that are acting and how they're going to act on the object. Okay? You never use it as your final vector diagram. Okay? It's just there to kind of act as your givens, identify your forces, things like that. Okay? In order to get my net force, net force is my vector sum of all the forces that are acting on the object. So I would have 16 newtons would be my net force. Okay, so my resultant is now my net force. Which way is this object going to accelerate? Yeah? If that's the way all the forces add up, that's the way the object's being pushed. The object has to accelerate in that direction. The acceleration of an object and its net force always share a vector. Okay? Their vector is always the same because the net force is what causes the acceleration. So they always have to be the same vector. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? I can't push something east and have it accelerate south. Okay? That's just not possible. The net force and the acceleration will always be in the same direction. Right? That's right into Newton's second law, okay, which is what we're going to talk about next week. Okay, I don't want to get too far into it this week because, well, you'll forget it all. And you have a test on Monday, which we need to talk about real quick. Um, so for period two, uh, show up right away. I'll let you write into lunch a little bit if you need to, okay? Like, let's say uh, 15 or 20 minutes. If you have uh, provisions through learning support for extra time and all of that, don't worry, you'll get it. Okay? Um, but after that amount of time, okay, like that extra 15 to 20 minutes, I don't even know if you'll need it, but um, then the test is over. Okay? There's no, like, can I come back after school? No. You started the test, you know what's on it, you can't leave and come back. Okay? That that's, takes away the security of the exam. Okay? Um, so know that that's the amount of time that you'll have. Um, make sure you have couple of pencils, couple of pens, and your calculator okay, uh, for the test okay, for Monday. Any other questions about the test for Monday? So you can write, you can have a little bit of extra time okay, if you want it. I don't know that you're going to need it because it didn't take me very long to make the key. So I don't think it'll take you guys very long to do the test. Okay. 